All right, so Esther chapter 4, we'll start at verse 6. So if I could have you stand for the reading of the word, please. So Hattak went out to Mordecai in the city square that was in front of the king's gate. And Mordecai told him all that had happened to him and the sum of the money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasuries to destroy the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the written decree of their destruction, which was given at Shushan that he might show to Esther and explain it to her that he might command her to go into the king to make supplication to him and plead before him for her people. So Hatak returned and told Esther the words of Mordecai. Then Esther spoke to Hatak and gave him a command to Mordecai. All the king's servants and all the king's people of the king's province know that any man or woman who goes into the inner court of the king who has not been called... He has but one law, put all to death, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter, that he may live. Yet I myself have not been called in to go before the king for these thirty days. So they told Mordecai Esther's words. And Mordecai told him to answer Esther, Do you not think in your heart, that you will escape the king's palace any more than any of the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will come for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet, who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Amen. You can be seated. That's probably the key verse, 14, for the entire book. So we're going to kind of look over Esther. This is one of my favorite books. There's a lot of special things that happen in Esther. Some people realize it, some don't. We really don't know who the writer is. A lot say it's Mordecai. If you look at um, verse 29... It says, Then Queen Esther, the daughter of Abihel, and Mordecai the Jew, wrote with full authority to confirm the second letter about Purim. So it talks about Mordecai writing. But then there's also um, another section. Now all the acts of his power and his might and the account of greatness of Mordecai to which the king advanced him are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the King and the, of Media and Persia? For Mordecai the Jew was second to the king Ahasuerus and was great among the Jews and well received by the multitude of his brethren, speaking the good works of people and speaking peace of all the countrymen. So there's a debate as to whether he actually did write it. But whoever did write it, obviously was there because of the description in the first chapter, how they could describe the palace, the courtyards, the the furnishings, and then to know all the details, there had to be somebody that was right there. The other curious thing, or amazing thing, about the entire book is not once... In all ten chapters, is God ever mentioned? Not once. There's no hint of prayer. There's no hint of turning to God. Nothing. The only thing that comes close is what Mordecai says in verse 14. That if Esther, you don't do anything, you'll perish as long as your house and somebody else or something else will come up for deliverance to the Jews. That's the closest thing there is. But yet, God's not mentioned, but the heathen king, Xerxes, now he's called a Hasuerus, just means like a, a father, but Xerxes was his actual name. 
He's mentioned 192 times, but God's never mentioned once. The other curious thing is, and you wonder why Scripture is put together the way it is. If you look at the order of the books in the New Testament, Nehemiah comes before Esther. But in time, Esther comes before Nehemiah. And Daniel actually comes before Esther. Because they're, the, Israel is taken into captivity by the Babylonian Empire, by Nebuchadnezzar. And then they remain in Babylon, and then the Medo-Persian take over, and then you have Xerxes. But before that, Nehemiah, who's the cupbearer for the king and finds favor with the king, he goes to him and says, hey, I want to go back and rebuild Jerusalem. And the king says, go ahead. I'll even help you. I'll finance you. I'll give you letters for safe travel. We'll send people to protect you. They go rebuild Jerusalem. Some of the people go back. A lot don't. And that's where we are with Esther. They're the people that did not go back to Jerusalem. They decided to stay where they were. They were comfortable. And that's where they stayed. All right. So if we start off. The wife who refused to obey her husband... So in the first chapter, Ahasuerus is throwing this huge party. 180 days, uh, six months. And to top it all off, that wasn't enough. He has another party, uh, a week long, with all the festivities. You know, just great big party. He's trying to build himself up. Because he wants to go to battle with the Greeks. But he gets wiped out. He really suffers a loss. Now the interesting. Xerxes is the son. Or uh, sorry. Artaxerxes is the king at the time. Artaxerxes the first. He is the son of Xerxes who was the one, now I'm getting my things all messed up. <laughs> yeah, Xerxes was the one that took Esther as the king. So, yeah, it was, yeah, skip that. I've got it all messed up. I messed up my notes. So, Anyway, just go by memory. So anyway, they have this big feast. There's all kinds of wine. Scripture tells us that the king provided all this wine and food and whatnot, although the drink wasn't compulsory, yet the wine flowed greatly. And the king himself participated a little too heavily kind of lost his mind and said, hey, you know what? My wife is so beautiful that I'm going to show her off to everybody. So he calls, he sends his servants to go get the queen to bring her in to show her off. And she says, no, I'm not coming. It's not right. I shouldn't be paraded around that way. It was against the custom. So she refused. That caused a big turmoil. Yeah. All of a sudden now, all the men are going, oh my goodness, what's going to happen here? If the queen won't obey the king, I'm going to go home. And now my wife is not going to obey me. This is causing a big problem. So they all got together and decided what they're going to do. And they said, okay, Queen Vashti will no longer be the queen. We're going to dismiss her. She's now 
done, and that's it. I'm going to be single again, and we're just going to make it a law that if you disobey the king, you disobey your husband, you're done. You're, that's it. So he put her aside. And that was supposed to take care of the problem. Oh, there we go. Okay, so they dismiss her. And now the king goes off to fight the Greeks. There's a disastrous campaign. Greece soundly defeats him. He returns back to the palace. He's all dejected. He's going, oh, you know, I got wiped out. I, uh, you know, now have to fear the Greeks because we know that later on the Greeks came in and defeated the Medo-Persian Empire. But he gets there and he's all dejected now and he goes, I don't even have a queen. I went and got rid of her, not thinking, and now I'm all alone. So the servants come to the king and say, okay. Let's have a beauty contest. So we'll put the word out throughout the kingdom. So in verses, uh, chapter 2, verses 5 and 6, they put out um, this announcement. We're going to have a beauty contest. So Mordecai, who's looking after Hadassah, which is her Jewish name, which is his, essentially his cousin, his, scripture tells us it's his uncle's daughter. So if you look at it, if it's his uncle, then Mor or Esther, which her name becomes, is his cousin. He takes her in after her parents die, and he raises her. So he says, okay, you enter the contest. Don't really know why, but apparently Esther was a very attractive young lady, and Mordecai thought, hey, this might be good. So he enters her. So Esther instantly or immediately pleases Haggai, the servant that's in charge of the contest. So right there, if you look at that and you look at Daniel, you look at Joseph, they all found favor with the ones that were over them. Same as Esther. So the hand of God is beginning to move providentially in the dealings now with the Jews. So Esther doesn't reveal that she's Jewish. She keeps that quiet. Mordecai tells her, don't tell anybody what your heritage is. Just keep it quiet. I don't know if he was afraid of something or, but for whatever reason, he tells her just, hey, don't say anything. The concern of Mordecai is evident for he feels that he can no longer turn to God for help. Evidentially, he's a short person, which adds to the interest of the record. He, for whatever reason, we don't know why, but Mordecai, he knows God's there, but he doesn't talk about him. He doesn't, doesn't turn to prayer. He doesn't say anything. So we continue through the book, verse 12, or through this chapter. The beauty treatments that take a long time. Six months for one and six months for another. A whole year. It's almost as bad as it is today. I'm trying to go somewhere. And so the funny thing is, Esther goes before the king, and she's not the first one. But as soon as the king lays eyes on her, the contest is over. Interesting. The contest is over. The king took one look at her, and that's it. He puts the crown on her. So in chapter 2, verses 19 to 23, Mordecai now is found sitting at the gate so, sort of means maybe he was given a political job. Kind of now as a judge, he overhears a plot of a couple of servants that they want to do away with the king. 
Now, this whole thing, I was going to mention this in the beginning. This whole book, if Hollywood or Follywood had a brain in their heads, they would go to these books in the Bible to make movies. This story has so many plot twists and drama and different things. I've always said this would make a fantastic movie. They did? No, I've never seen or heard of it. It was just, but this is where we should get this kind of stuff from. So Mordecai hears this plot and he goes to Esther and Esther takes it to the king and the king investigates and finds out it's true. And he takes care of these conspirators. And he has it all recorded in the records. And that's where it ends. So along comes Haman. And Haman is promoted to the king to a position roughly that of a prime minister. He's kind of oversees everything. The king's right-hand man. Now, not a lot of people know this or understand this. Haman is an agite. And Haman has this distaste for the Jews. Because of his promotion, everybody is supposed to bow down to him. Mordecai utterly refuses. And if you look at the Mosaic Law in Deuteronomy, which is chapter 5, verses 7 to 10, is part of the Ten Commandments. And it talks about not bowing to anyone but God. And Mordecai stands by that. You look at Daniel. In chapter 3 and chapter 12, you've got Daniel, or in chapter 3, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego won't bow down before the grave, the golden image when they hear the music play, and they get thrown into the fiery furnace. And Daniel won't stop praying when they're ordered to only pray to the king. He refuses, and he openly prays to God, and he's thrown in the lion's den. Now, if I don't talk about Esther, I'll talk about Daniel, because that's my, one of my other favorite books. There are so many things in there for life today. But anyway, Mordecai wouldn't bow down. Haman is furious. He wants to get rid of Mordecai. He wants to do away with the Jews. He's just this anger and wrath. And if you look back, it all comes from Saul being disobedient to God. In Samuel chapter 1 Samuel 15 Samuel goes to Saul and says the Lord says this go attack the Malachites and utterly destroy them. Let me read this. Now go and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all they have. Do not spare them, but kill both women, child, infant, nursing child, ox, sheep, camel, donkey, everything. Utterly obliterate them. And what does same Saul do? He goes, he captures King Agag, spares him, and then he gathers the best of the sheep and the ox and whatnot because we're going to use it for a sacrifice. Thinking he's going to please the Lord by having all this stuff to sacrifice. But that's not what God said. God told him to utterly destroy them completely. And because he didn't do that, we have descendants now in Esther, Haman, who's a descendant from King Agag. And he has all these hatred to the Jews because of what they did. So he wants to utterly 
destroy them. The lesson here is, and we've seen it time and time in Scripture, if you don't do what God does says to do, the consequences are far-reaching. Some parts say, you know, the sins of the father will be passed on to the third and fourth or the fourth and fifth generations. Look at what we have today. Because Sarah laughed at God when he told her he was, she was going to have a son because she was somewhere in her 80s or 90s. It was say, uh, Abraham was 75 when God told him, hey, get out of your father's house and go. And at, during that time, he said, you're going to have a son. And Sarah actually laughed when the angel told Abraham that was going to happen. And it took 20 years for that promise to come true. But Sarah couldn't wait. So what'd she do? She said to Abraham, hey, go into my handmaid and have a child with her and we'll have a son that way. But that's not what God promised and that's not what God said to do. But she chose not to wait. And as my wife says, that's the four-letter word that she hates, having to wait. And we all struggle with that waiting on God. We sometimes think we know better, we can do better, or we can help God with his plan by doing our own thing. But then we have consequences. So now we have Ishmael as a consequence of that sin. To this day, we still have the Arab nation that are warring with the Jews. So it's just not going to hurt you when you do things. It has far-reaching implications. So one of the lessons is, do what God tells us to do. Life's a little easier that way. So Haman, in his hatred for the Jews, and his position with the king, says, I'm going to go to the king, and I'm going to offer him all this silver, all this money, and I'm going to get the king to agree to let me annihilate the Jews. Now he never says he wants to annihilate the Jews. He just says, there's a people in the land that don't do what you do, that don't follow the same rules. They, they're kind of going to be a problem for you. So let me help you with that problem. Let me get rid of that. And here's the money. Now, Ahasuerus is going, whoa, money. I just lost a fortune. I spent a fortune trying to wipe out the Greeks, yeah, I need to build up the coffers again. So, yeah, that sounds good. Here you go. Make this decree and set it all out. So a decree is drawn up and sent throughout the kingdom, permitting the people of the land to slay the Jews on the 13th day of Adar, or 13th day of March. And the people are shocked. At this decree. It's like, where did this come from? So this is one of many attempts for Satan to wipe out the Jews. Again, we see somehow we have to stop the Savior. We have to somehow do something to once again wipe out the Jews so that prophecy of the one that's going to crush the head of Satan, but have his heel bruised, cannot happen. So here again, God is moving through this story. So Mordecai, in chapter 4, he starts mourning. He puts on sackcloth and ashes. But again, there's no mention of prayer. He doesn't say, there's nothing says he turns to God. He just puts on the sackcloth and ashes and he's outside the gate. The Jews throughout the kingdom start mourn, mourning. If we look at chapter 4, verse 3. But again, no mention of prayer. They're not turning to God. They're just all complaining and grumbling. So Esther, and this is where the 
we start with the passage we read. Esther sees Mordecai. She's embarrassed by it. She sends a servant out to get Mordecai to change his clothes. She sends clothes out for him. Mordecai refuses. He sends, no, here's what's going on. And for whatever reason, Esther didn't know. Scripture doesn't explain to us why, but she was unaware of this decree. So then she sends the message back to Mordecai, and this is when he says, hey, you need to do something, because if you don't, don't think that because you're the queen, you or your family will be spared. And if you don't do anything, God will still, but he doesn't say God, he just says, the um, saving of the Jews will come from somewhere else. And Esther's all concerned because she hasn't been in to see the king for 30 days. Now, the Medo-Persian Empire has a rule or law that once a law is made, it cannot be changed or modified. Once it's written, that's it. The king can't change, he can change his mind, but he can't change the law. And the law was that if you go into the king's presence uninvited, unless he holds out his golden scepter, you're dead. They're on the spot. That's the law. So Esther's fearful. She doesn't say, well, you know, I'm going to trust God and I'm going to go before the king. I'm going to try and make, you know, uh, a plea for my people. She doesn't think that way at all. She just listens to Mordecai that says, hey, you need to go in and you need to plead your case. This is now where you need to save your people. So she accepts the challenge and goes in and she's standing in the courtyard and the king sees her. And he calls her and he hands out his scepter and she goes in and they talk. Now the king says to her, you know, what, what brings you here? He says, the, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. Like the rivers of the water, he turneth it whether he, whithersoever he will. Proverbs 21, 1. So God is working in this king because he sees Esther, and he says, oh, okay, yeah, come on in. So he says to Esther, you know, what is it that you want? So the king senses a real crisis in her. So he gives assurance by promising to grant her up to half of the kingdom. Now, men, who here would write a blank check, and hand it to your wife. <laughs> Not many would. But the king, he says, I'll give you up to half of the kingdom. What is it that's troubling you? What do you need? And it's, we're reminded here, Philippians 4.19, But my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. So Esther says, you know what, and I don't know if she planned this, or, but she says, I want to invite you and Haman to a luncheon, to a banquet. And the king says, okay, great. And this is where things start to take a little twist. So Haman's all pleased that the uh, king or the queen is inviting him with the king to a banquet. He goes home, and he starts bragging. He says, look at me. The queen 
has asked me to lunch with the king. I'm something special. And we sometimes do that. We let pride get in our way. So he goes and he's bragging to his wife. And he's also been complaining about Mordecai. And he's just so frustrated when he sees Mordecai after getting this boost that he's going to lunch with the queen and the king. And Mordecai is just under his skin and just eating at him. Then his wife and servant said, hey, why don't you just get rid of this guy? Just build a, a gallows and hang him. And he says, that's a great idea. And he takes it to that nth degree. Now Mordecai is apparently a, a short, smaller in stature. But Haman builds this gallows. That's 50 cubits, 150 feet. Why do you need to build such a structure to get rid of one individual that's a thorn in your side? That's a little over the top. But he's so bugged by Mordecai that that's what he does. So then the next day they go for this luncheon. And at the luncheon... Esther reveals what's going on. No, actually, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Before that luncheon, the king can't sleep. So the start of chapter 6. The king couldn't sleep at all. So we thought, you know what? There's all things we do when we can't sleep that we'll probably do to kind of distract us or put us to sleep. So what does the king do? He says, read me the Chronicles. That'll bore me to tears and that'll put me to sleep. And here again we see the hand of God. So they start reading the Chronicles and they talk about... Mordecai, and how he revealed the plot and saved the king from these would-be assassins. And the king says to him, what did, what, what did we do for him? Did we ever acknowledge what Mordecai did? And they said no. In verse 3, we we see that Mordecai had not been recognized or rewarded. So the king says, all right, we're going to fix that. So at that early hour that morning, Haman comes in. And this is now where we see things twist and turn and what makes it a, a good story. Haman walks in and he wants to execute Mordecai. And he wants to get permission from the king so that he can do it. And before he can say a word, the king says, hey, you're just the guy I should ask this. What should be done for the man whom the king delights to honor? <laughs> Haman, he's already feeling pretty good about himself that he's been invited not once but twice to lunch with the king and queen. Figures, oh, the king's talking about me. He wants to honor me. So here's what I would like. And he goes on to say, you know, take one of your coats and one of your horses and the crown and put on all this elaborate ceremony and then have somebody parade this person around through the, the town and whatnot and, you know, decree that, you know, everybody should honor this individual and he's just thinking all the stuff he wants done for him and the king looks at him and says great i love your idea your thinking's right on go gather all that stuff put haman on the horse or mordecai on the horse and you walk him around 
Now, how do you think Haman is going to think, what? I, I could just imagine the, the rage within him. I hate this guy so much. And now the king wants me to dress him up, put him on the king's horse, and, and parade him through town. I, how, I, it, oh, I could just imagine what's going through his mind. So the proposal, you know, it just shows you that Haman figured he's so close to the throne that this is one next step to it. And then he's stunned and humiliated by what the king wants to order, honor Mordecai. So this time, Haman returns home to cry instead of boast. Now he's seething. He's, how dare the king make me Walk Mordecai, this Jew around. And he's just going on. And his wife and friends warn him, warn him that he's in grave danger. Somehow, all of a sudden, now they see what's going on. And they start putting it together. And while Hel Haman is still bemoaning the sad events, the king's servants bring Haman to Esther's banquet. So they take him and they go to the banquet. And for the third time, the king goes to Esther with this blank check. You know, For up to half of the kingdom, what's going on? And now, Esther, so in chapter 7, verses 3 and 4, Esther is now reveals this plot of Haman's. And the king, this is where she says, my people. She reveals that she's a Jew and that this plot is out. Not just to take care of people in the kingdom that don't kind of fit in with the king's way of doing things. But it's actually the Jewish people. And the king demands to know who it is. And the queen points. Or gestures, it says. Identifies Haman as the man. Haman is stunned. He didn't know Esther was a Jew. He had no idea that his plot was going to involve the queen. Now, we would have a hard time writing a story that twists and turns like this. But all through this, God's hand is at work. So the king is astonished. He, he can't believe himself that this is what Haman's been after the whole time. And now that it's directed towards the queen, he's livid. He actually gets up from the banquet and goes out to the garden. He's got to walk it off. He's got to think. He's got to figure out what to do because... That law has been placed. He can't change it. So he can't go back on what has already been in place. In the meantime, Haman, who now is probably standing there shaking at his knees, thinking, oh, I've stepped in it. The king is furious. My plot's been exposed. I've now implicated the queen. So he is down, likely on his knees, but in that time when you're dining, you're kind of reclining on a pillows or some kind of a, um, a bench or whatnot. So he's down, not in front of the queen, but actually kind of falls on her or lays over the queen, begging for his life because he knows he's had it. The king walks in and finds Haman on the queen. He just loses his mind. How dare you? He orders then that Haman be taken out and hung on his own gallows. 
be careful of how you handle things because it can come back to do the same thing to you. You might be trying to accomplish something, but if you don't do it the right way, it can come back and affect you the same way. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. And every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment, thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servant of the Lord. And the righteous is from me, saith the Lord. Isaiah fifty four seventeen. In Psalm 37, verses 35 and 6, 36. I have seen the wicked in great power, and is spreading himself like a green bay tree. Yet he passes the way, and lo, he is not. Yea, I sought him, but he could not be found. God is in control. Because the first decree could not be changed, another decree had to be sent out. So the king gets together with Mordecai and Esther, and they come up with a, a new decree. So the king's government that initially demanded their execution now is at a point of defending them. This brings salvation and deliverance to the people who are otherwise would have perished. So the degree, a decree has gone out from God to mankind. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Ezekiel 18.20 And the wages of sin is death. Romans 6.23 Although it has not been altered or canceled, man need not perish. For another decree has gone out from God. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth should not perish, but have everlasting life. That day would have meant destruction for the people of Israel. It's a day in their great deliverance. The darkness is turned to light. Night is turned to day. This day becomes another holy day for the nation. It's called the Feast of Purim. Esther 9, 22 to 30, 20 to 32. That's a feast to this day is still celebrated by the Jews. It's almost like Christmas is to us. They have a great party in celebration of their deliverance. The lot is cast into the lap, but the whole disposing thereof is of the Lord. Proverbs 16.33 So many believe, sorry, many believers know only of a distant and strange providence. They do not learn to walk with God in close fellowship, obeying his word as someone has expressed it. He knows and loves and cares nothing this truth can dim. He gives the very best to those whom leave the choice to him. So it's interesting to see that Herodias, the Greek historian, states that the wife of Ahasuerus, or Xerxes, is a cold, vindictive queen after invasion against Greece, for an order, for an outsider, this would appear to be fact, but it's not. So, what's the message of Esther? Very simple. God is still on the throne, and God is still in control. No matter what we're going through. No matter what life brings, God is in control. And it's happening for a purpose. And if we allow it, he will use that purpose to glorify him. And he'll do it through us if we allow him. And that's our prayer for everyone, is that, first of all, you realize you're a sinner Repent of your sins and accept Christ as Savior. And then live a life that's pleasing and honoring to Him. And through that, God's work can be done 
and we can bring others to Christ. That's what we're here for. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this story. We call it a story, but it is not a story as in a fairy tale or a fable that's been written by man. It's history. It happened. And it's interesting that you would put this book in your word with the story of a woman. It's only one of two books that talk about a woman or name a woman by name. But yet we can see your hand at work throughout this entire story. That even if we don't follow or do your will, your will will still be done in spite of us. But we pray, Lord, and we thank you for the lesson in it that we can be greatly used of you, used by you, if we just wait and listen and lean on you for your direction and for your guidance. So we pray, Lord, for each and every one that hears this word, that they would wait on you and trust you and follow you and be a light for you. We just thank you and praise you for your word and for the work of the cross and the Lord Jesus Christ. It's in his name we give you thanks. Amen.